Thank you for speaking with me, Professor Richardson. Can you begin by saying what inspired you to write a history of the Republican Party? Well, thanks for having me, Elliot. You can't understand American history today without understanding what happened after the Civil War and in the early Reconstruction years. And in order to understand that, you have to understand the Republicans. So I became early on a historian of the Republican Party, really because I wanted to understand America. And I wrote a number of books on the Republican Party in the 19th century, but then I taught the Republican Party in the 20th century. And it seemed like a natural bridge to do both of them, since nobody really had done a history of the Republican Party based in primary sources. So that's where it all started, way back in 1987. You discuss how the party was largely born of a reaction against some of the core values that we associate with them today. Are you finding that some readers are surprised about this history? Actually, what really surprised me, I think, is how many readers grabbed hold of this book and said, this is the Republican Party that I know. There's been big pushback from the people I call movement conservatives, people who are Tea Partiers or people who are part of the neocon movement, and they're very unhappy with the book. But I expected there to be much more pushback from people who felt that this was tarring the Republican Party as somehow being evil, which I was not trying to do. I was trying to reclaim the history of the, history of the party. And what's been interesting to me is how many people have written to me or have posted about this online and said, oh yes, this is the Republican Party I knew and loved. Where has it gone and how can we get it back? And was there anything in particular that surprised you as you pursued your research? Well, there's a lot of things that surprised me. Uh, a lot of fun things. Many of the people that I thought I would love, I ended up not liking. And uh, one of the things that you'll be interested in is because of all the new digital technologies we have, one of the things that I could do that people could not do in the past was to follow an event as it happened in newspapers across the country because we now have those wonderful digital newspapers that you can search as a group by day. So for example, my account of the Panic of 1893 is different than anybody else's is because I could read all the newspapers day by day and watch how that fell like dominoes across the country. And that was technology that wasn't available to people even you know, five or 10 years ago. So those things were surprising. I think for me, intellectually, the most surprising thing was how Reconstruction played out which considering I've written a number of books on Reconstruction, that was a surprise, but also Watergate. I conceived of this book as hinging around Watergate. I thought Watergate was gonna be the most important event of the 20th century for the Republican Party. I thought it was going to be huge, and I sold the book with the idea that Watergate was gonna be huge, and when I actually did the research and put it in the context of the larger party, I don't wanna say it wasn't important, certainly it was important, but it was not the hinge for the party at all, and it took a much smaller role in the book than I expected it to. You say of the TARP program that was passed during the McCain-Obama campaign that the rift in the party between reality and image was too deep. Can you talk a little bit about how the Republican Party has successfully presented and manipulated their own image? That's a great question. The Republican Party managed way earlier than the Democrats did to recognize that they really had to make their case in the media. So one of the first things they do in the 1850s is they make sure they have major newspaper editors on board, and they continue to do that extraordinarily effectively throughout their entire history, way more effectively than the Democrats ever managed to do. So they've always been very aware of that. But what I meant when I talked about uh, the, the rift between image and reality being extraordinary by the, the 2000 aughts was that beginning really in 1980, but the seeds of it reached all the way back to the 1950s, 1951, with the publication of God and Man at Yale with, uh, by, by William F. Buckley Jr., was the, the leaders of the party, the opinion shapers of the party, people like Buckley, people like the National Review, um, people like the Chicago Tribune, the, the major players, um, some of the major newspaper chains, recognized that government intervention in social issues in America, regulating business, um, providing safety nets, all those things were extraordinarily popular. People really liked those. They liked the New Deal. They liked Eisenhower's middle way. They liked the idea that the federal government would take a role in making life more secure for Americans and making sure that business didn't um, abuse its workers, which it very much did during the 1920s. And the problem with that for 
the people that I come to call movement conservatives is that they didn't like the very programs that were so enormously popular. They especially didn't like business regulation. They didn't want the government to be regulating business. They didn't like taxes either, but mostly they didn't want governments to be telling them how they should be treating their workers and how they should be handling their workplace issues. So they came up with the idea that they simply couldn't engage with the public with facts, because if people looked at the facts, they chose government intervention. So beginning in the 1950s, and then it really takes off in the 1980s, you have a real divorce in the Republican Party between the factual basis for their arguments and what they present as reality. So by the time you get to the TARP program, it you know, economists pretty generally agreed that you had to have the Troubled Asset Relief Program or the entire world economy was going to collapse. And it was actually, I taught that day, it was actually a fascinating day because if the markets fell apart the way it looked like they were going to do, it really did look like the world economy was going to fall apart. But the problem was TARP was government activism. And so you couldn't both save the world economy and insist that you hated government activism. And you saw that rift very deeply in American politics on that day and on that week and as that played out over the course of the whole issue of TARP, that people who at the same time needed the government to step in were saying, you can't have any kind of government activism. And you can't have both. And you're seeing that now, I think, dramatically in this upcoming election, people who are arguing that the government has no role in the American economy and in American life, at the same time are trying to attract voters who like the government being involved in the American economy and American life. And it's not something that you can any longer paper over because we have so carefully and closely stripped to the bone all of those programs that people really don't have the wiggle room that they had in the 1980s or the 1970s or the 1960s when they first started talking about government activism being a bad thing. So you present the economic and political history of the last 150 years or so as multiple cycles of the Republican Party reversing its course of progressive values. And I'm left wondering, what role do you see the Democratic Party playing in this oscillation between liberal and movement conservative Republicans? That's a wonderful question. And people ask me if I'm now going to write a history of the Democratic Party, and I have said no again and again and again. And yet, the more people have asked, the more it has become attractive to me. And what I would say about that is that, from my perspective, the difference between the parties intellectually is that because of the rise of the Republican Party at the time of the Civil War, when the country really was reinventing itself entirely with a new system of government, a new system of taxation, a new region, the West gets added in, the country really is reborn during the Civil War. And because of its timing, the Republican Party is associated with the American nation in a way that the Democratic Party is not. That's not to say it's not an American party, but its imperatives are much different because the Democratic Party rises much earlier. It rises with a different set of issues, and it has its own internal dynamic. So a, a, a picture of the Republican Party, uh, the Democratic Party, would not simply be the reverse of the Republican Party. So from that, what I, and I'm not entirely sure yet what I think about the Democratic Party in terms of its historical trajectory, although obviously I'm thinking about it. But I think what I would say about the role of the Democrats in the Republican Party is that their imperatives sometimes coincide with the, re with the trajectory of the Republicans. So sometimes what the Democrats are doing has an effect, um, and that they are both pushed by what's going on in the American economy and American society, and by the 20th century in wor the world at large, but that it's not really a push-pull, that they have different trajectories that sometimes come together and sometimes don't. You can see it really dramatically how they come together in the 1880s, for example, when somebody like Grover Cleveland that nobody knows about, but he's actually quite cool, that Grover Cleveland, who's a Democrat, is kind of the anti-Republican. But you don't always get an anti-Republican. Um, more often you get the parties jockeying around issues and kind of having different conversations that sometimes coincide and sometimes don't. Were there particular considerations you had to make in pursuing a historical research project with such a political charge around it and an election season to boot? Well, it's funny. I didn't intend to publish it during an election, an election season. That was just the oddities of timing. But what's funny about that is that 
you know, I'm a historian, and I really didn't realize it was a hot button topic. It's just a cool topic. It was the first way I went into it. Um, so, no, I didn't realize it was going to be a big deal. And then, of course, I figured it out by the time I got into the, the George W. Bush administration. And what happened was that I found myself, by the time I was researching the chapters, where there would be people alive who remembered them. I so over-researched them that at one point when I was doing the, the chapter that covers, and it covers not just um, George W. Bush, but, but other administrations as well, that that chapter ends up being somewhere in the vicinity of 30 pages. And I had well over 500 footnotes, all in primary sources. And I remember sitting at my desk, covered with papers, and manically reading more and more and more, more newspapers, more evidence, more uh, government dispatches, more everything I could find. And I remember at one point literally putting my hands on the table and saying, I've got to stop. If I were doing this about the 1920s or the 1850s or the 1870s, I would have said done 300 sources ago. I'm not adding anything here. I'm just trying to make myself feel like I've covered everything so that nobody is going to be upset with this. And the bottom line is, this is, as a historian, when I look at this, this is what I see happened. Now, other historians can take that on and disagree and say, look, I've got all these other sources that prove that this is not the case. Well, great, then let's have a debate about it. But what it came down to was I felt like I had to cover the modern day stuff way better than I felt like I had to cover the 1890s, which I hope are well covered as well, too. But that was the place that I saw a real difference in the way I presented the, uh, the modern day material than the older stuff. So how did you arrive at this central theme of the conflict between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? Well, it's actually kind of a cool story. The idea that the Republican Party started in equality of opportunity is all over the literature. I mean, you just can't miss that. And, and you know, it's all over Lincoln. It's all over the early Republicans. This is really what they care about. The, one of their initial rallying cries was free soil, free labor, free men. I mean, it's everywhere. And then, of course, by the 1880s, they're switching really clearly into a protection of property. I mean, that's the robber barons. That's the you know, the declaration that um, the 14th Amendment was designed to protect corporations, I mean, all that sort of thing. So there was that inherent in the party research itself. But the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that, in part because the Republican Party so thoroughly represents America, I think, in from the late 19th century on, that there was this inherent conflict that showed up between the Declaration of Independence, which is what the Republicans rely on, and the Constitution, which is what the slaveholders and then the robber barons and then throughout the, the rest of the history, what they rely on. And that central conflict between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, I started thinking about that right about the time I was teaching a course at Boston College in classics in American history, a course I entitled really to give me license to teach anything I wanted. And, and when I put the course together, I didn't have any great themes in mind, except I want to teach books that everybody should read. You know, C. Van Woodward, W.B. Du Bois, um, Angie DeBow, I mean, some of, the, some of the biggies that everybody, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, that everybody should read and that most people get through college without reading. And what's interesting about that is that within three weeks of starting to teach that course, my students and I both figured out that what made a classic, out of all the books that I had picked mostly because they're the books that everybody has heard of, what made all those books distinctive, and it was noticeable, we were not looking for it, but it, it really came out by the third or fourth week of class, was that they grappled with major questions either in human history like Walter Prescott Webb did in the Great Plains about whether or not the environment determines who we become, um, great themes in, in human history or in American history, like what drives American politics, which is the central question, for example, of Charles Beard's The Economic Origins of the American Constitution, which is really not saying that the founding fathers were Marxist or whatever. He was simply saying that 
great leaders are not driven solely by ideology, that in fact they have other interests, in this case economic interests. Um, and those larger questions about what it means to be a human being or what it means to be an American, which has always been the central question that has driven my career, like what does it mean to be an American, um, just jumped out at me from this, from the material I was looking at. And, and the question of reconciling the Declaration and the Constitution and the fact that we never have completely reconciled those and we still struggle with them every single day in America really grew out of that course and the material and I think makes the book a worthwhile read for people who could not care less about the Republican Party or politics for that matter because it really is a central question to my mind of what it means to be an American.